sure to check out our free InfoSec Day, March 3rd or March 5th. Please ask us for an invitation. If you don't already have one, everyone's invited. Oh, hi, uh, Dan Hathaway here, uh, playing harmonica in uh, beautiful Grand Canyon. Um, not really, um, which is kind of brings us to our uh, You Spoke, We Listened initiative here in 2020. Uh, we actually uh, took a lot of feedback from clients and regular webinar attendees uh, throughout the year of 2019 and uh, boiled everything down to seven different suggestions, uh, six of which we can make work and we're putting into action right now. Um, starting with the fact that um, I wasn't in front of the Grand Canyon, I was in front of a green screen, uh, though we started off recording webinars and posting them as movies. We're now actually recording movies and posting them as webinars. And so the first suggestion that, uh, you know, a few of you made was just call it a movie. All right, we're doing that. This is a movie. We aren't actually there. The second suggestion kind of relates to the first suggestion in our opinion is if we're going to show a movie, maybe we can have a panel discussion after the movie. And so uh, we're actually going to implement that in our February webinar. Uh, where we talk about how the cybersecurity assessment tool can, you know, uh, um, how you can achieve compliance with many of the baseline and, and evolving statements in the CAT uh, by using our SEAM. And so we're calling it the SEAM CAT or, or um, uh, what the CAT seems to be, I think, is uh, the name of the webinar. Uh, but the point is, is this going to be just like this one where it's a pre-recorded movie, but then after the movie, we're going to have a panel of the developers of our seam available to answer questions. I'll get the ball going. I'm pretty good at moderating panel discussions. The third and probably the most important uh, suggestion that we're going to implement is to get a regular schedule and stick to it. And that's really, uh, um, that came actually after our uh, um, our webinar that we canceled the first time and then we actually had to cancel a second webinar which by the way shouldn't happen anymore because they're pre-recorded movies right so we're we're doing this webinar on uh, you know in early January and we're not even going to show it until you know mid-January right and so we believe that we're going to be able to honor the webinar schedule that's on webinars.infotex.com uh, we will not change them we will not cancel those webinars um, a couple of you asked for live video of Dan. That's what I'm doing now. I hope this makes the webinar more interesting. I don't know why anybody would want to, you know, watch or you know, look at me, but hey. Um, and then, of course, uh, the two uh, suggestions that most of you gave us was, A, make them shorter, uh, which this one would be a lot shorter if I didn't have this You Spoke, We Listen section at the beginning of it, but we're definitely there. We are going to come out with a series of webinar shorts where we try to keep them the 20 minutes in length, uh, and we'll identify those on our uh, on webinars.infotex.com as shorts. And then the last suggestion is the one we couldn't implement, which is move the legal disclaimers to the end of the webinar. And that kind of helped us realize, oh, I bet, you know, after watching the second or third webinar, that gets kind of old. But we still want to leave the legal disclaimers at the beginning of the webinar. And the reason why is because not everybody is a regular webinar attendee like you, right? You know, some people are here for the first time and they need to know the, the limits and the weaknesses with our education strategy. And so because of that, we can't move the legal disclaimers to the end. But we can do one thing. We can direct your attention to the fast forward button in your uh, movie player. And so um, with that, I think I'll uh, just kind of um, return to our regularly scheduled legal disclaimer. Thanks for joining us. Our lawyers want you to know that when you attend any of our webinars or watch any of our movies, you're agreeing to the terms of service located at the link on the screen. We're also required to provide this abbreviation of what our terms of service include. The main point we need to get across is that regulations change on a regular basis, and we want you to know that what we present can sometimes be very time-dated information or our own interpretation of new guidance or regulations. The materials we present today are subject to change. Also, whenever we provide free boilerplates as part of our webinars or movies, we're required to point out our transfer of copyright agreement, which is also located on our website, in our IT resources library. 
You can read it by going to the link on the screen. Please also note, by attending an Infotex webinar or by receiving any Infotex movie, you may be added to our mailing list. We apologize if you'd rather not receive notice of other free education. You can always opt out at the link on the screen. And one last thing before we introduce our moderator, Michael Hartke. We'll be initiating a survey directly after the webinar, and we ask you to take a minute to fill it out. We would really appreciate it. And now, it is our pleasure to introduce to you our webinar moderator. The code curator and special envoy from the seam, Michael Hartke. Hello, my name is Michael Hartke, and I'm the moderator for this movie entitled Teaching Your Board of Directors. And now, I'd like to introduce the speaker of today's event, the awareness guru from Indiana, the breaker of tech and enforcer of policy. He has 13 letters after his name, and they all spell risk management. Dan Hathaway. Dan? Thank you very much, Michael, and uh, welcome, everybody, to our first webinar of 2020. I am going to start with a little bit of a shout out to myself this time because every year I write an article called The Magnificent Seven. It's based on the movie where seven gunslingers are hired to protect a little town and they end up realizing that the only way they're going to be able to protect this town is to teach the people in the town to protect themselves, which is what information security officers do on a regular basis, right? And so I've been writing this article for, gosh, at least 10 years now, every year at the end of the year. Um, it's based on the seven trends that we think every small financial institution is going to be addressing. Uh, this year's article, obviously, is, is uh, looking at trends in 2020. Um, it's one of three different sevens, we call it, the M7, the P7, and the R7. Uh, the, um, the Magnificent Seven article comes out every Thanksgiving, um, and then on Christmas, uh, we, we compile our poster site and we produce a list of the top seven posters based on view count over the previous 12 months. And then finally, R7 is this webinar here, and we do it every January. Um, it's actually based on a list that I create uh, every year uh, for the director presentations I need to do in our audit engagement. But uh, let me just kind of show you what the middle movie looks like here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go out to uh, movies.infotex.com. Uh, when you go out there, this is what you'll find. Um, it's a list of all the training videos, uh, the recorded webinars that we've done over the, the past year. And, uh, you know, I mean, you'll notice that there's a lot of different webinars about a lot of different things, but by way of helping you understand what the uh, purpose of this webinar is, um, we're basically uh, recording uh, this right now. This is the webinar you're actually watching right now from 2019. Um, once we have this done, by the way, this will be at the top of the list, right? There'll be an R7 uh, Superheroes Guide to 2020, right? Uh, but this is the actual 30-minute movie that's meant to be presented directly to your board. And so we actually have um, uh, several different middle movies out there. Uh, one about out-of-wallet questions, um, and then two more movies for your directors, uh, Vulnerability Management for Directors and uh, Incident Response for Directors. So suffice it to say that when you're done watching this webinar, you'll be able to go right back to movies.infotext.com and see the movie that you could show directly to your board. Uh, but you don't have to watch it again. And the reason why is because we're including it as the middle movie in, in this webinar. Um, now, uh, one other thing before we 
actually you know dive into that middle movie is that i wanted to show you the boilerplate that we make available uh, as a part of this webinar every year and so this is the annual report to the board or the annual information security report to the board uh, boilerplate and uh, suffice it to say that most banks already have been delivering annual reports to the board for several years now but if you're a new iso um, or, you know, I mean, if you're taking over for somebody else or whatever, and you kind of want to get the scoop behind the annual report to the board, or you just want to make sure that you've got everything that you could have in that annual report to the board. Um, this is really the last iteration we, we made of this was in 2012. It hasn't really changed very much um, because the guidance hasn't changed for the directors. There's really only one other thing that you need to do with the directors, and that's get your risk appetite statement. Um, the original guidance is the Information Security Handbook. It's, it's still in the updated guidance that came out in 2015. But suffice it to say, uh, the main reason why we wanted to show you that is because we kind of look at awareness training as three different interactive processes. We want to educate, we want to motivate, and then we want to activate awareness. The education of your board is your annual report to the board. Um, the activation of your board, you know, making, putting them on guard, so to speak, is probably your audit reports, maybe your risk assessment, that sort of thing. But what should motivate your board is direct engagement with them or hopefully some of the movies that they can watch uh, that we make available on our website. And so with that, um, I'm hoping that uh, Michael will be ready to introduce the movie within the movie. Um, this is going to be, you know, really where we record the movie that we show directly to your directors. Um, and so it's going to start with Mike introducing me. Mike? Today's topic is officially called R7 2020's Top 7 Risks. This topic is one that Dan tackles every year on our blog, called R7 The Top 7 Risks. But here at Infotex, we believe that if you are watching this, you are your organization's superhero. In the interest of time, let me dive right into introducing our presenter, Dan Hathaway, who has been working with small banks since 2001. Dan? Well, thank you very much, Michael, and uh, thank you very much for dedicating 30 minutes of your very busy schedule to watch this movie. Um, not only am I appreciative of that, but more importantly, your information security officer appreciates it because, you know, it shows the boards on board, right? But even more importantly, your customers they might not realize they appreciate that you're spending this time, but by you watching this movie, ultimately your customers are gonna be safer. And really we're gonna talk about that, about the board's role in making our customers safer, the, the board's role in cybersecurity. Um, and then we'll talk about the, the top risk that the typical community-based bank faces um, in 2020. And then finally, we'll talk about how you can actually put your role to work in making our customers safer. Now, what we like to do is we like to use the metaphor of the canary in the coal mine to help non-technical people understand how they plug into cybersecurity. So just by quick review, um, back in the day before we had the technology to determine chemicals in the air, right? Uh, we would, well, not we, but coal miners would put canaries at strategic locations in the coal mine and then the miners were supposed to watch those canaries and if they look sick that was their cue to get the heck out of the coal mine uh, before methane gas blew everybody up or other other people got sick from ingesting the methane gas or whatever and so from a metaphorical perspective then what we're really wanting to do is make sure that we're managing the sick birds that our information security system may experience because of new threats, new risks, new assets, new everything, right? And so, you know, metaphorically, when we talk about the board's role, what we're really saying is, are we checking them birds? Are, are you know, are we watching the birds? You know, uh, what's kind of uh, terrible is if all, after all the effort that the you know, the, the owner of the coal mine would go through to put the canary strategically in the coal mine. If the miners just kept walking past a dead bird, that would be terrible, right? 
But that happens in cybersecurity way too often. And so we need the board to make sure the management team remembers that they should be checking them birds. Meanwhile, then, you know, in terms of the, the metaphor and, and the agenda for today, what we're going to be talking about when we get to the top risk for 2020 is what can make those canaries sick in 2020. And then finally, you know, let's question them birds. How do we go about asking the right questions to make sure that our canaries are staying healthy? And so are we checking them birds? The, the, the role that you face as a director in a bank um, there was a time, just so you know, you know, between 2000 and 2006, I would present to the boards of many different banks, and we didn't really have any guidance to go by yet. And so we would just rely on CIA is what we called it, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And we'd talk to directors about how this is what we mean by information security, and it didn't take long for us to add legal and compliance to those three because you're a bank, right? And so there's all kinds of legal and compliance risk. And, and, and that's how, you know, auditing's got started, right? But let's face it, because you're a bank, your re reputation is very, very important. And, and thus, tabletop testing your incident response plan, tabletop testing your business continuity plan is something that was kind of an important control to have in place. But I want you to know that what we kind of learned over the years is though this is kind of a good you know, starting point to go by in terms of defining what your role is, it's really kind of meaningless unless we keep our management team focused in on protecting our customers. Your role as a board member is to make sure that the management team doesn't get so bogged down in all this stuff that they lose sight of what the primary goal is, which is to protect our customers. Now, it wasn't until 2015, nine years after the, you know, the guidance came out in 2006 that articulated the board's role, um, that we had any other kind of guidance. But in 2006, the FFIEC published the Information Security Handbook that said it actually articulated your role and, and we kind of simplified it into two directions. You, you, you look backwards and you look forwards as a director. And so when you review your vendor risk reports, when you review your audit reports, when you review that annual report to the board, I hope you all you know, recognize when I say the annual report to the board, that's really looking backwards. Your information security officer is basically saying, here's what happened. And that's very important, and, and you know, the guidance kind of articulates how important it is that as a director, you review these reports. And then looking forwards, you're involved in policy approval, you're reviewing the results of various risk assessments, including your Graham Leach Bliley risk assessment, and now your 2015 risk assessment, you know, your cybersecurity assessment tool assessment, right? But suffice it to say, you have to approve new technologies. Ultimately, you have to approve the IT audit plan. That's all looking forward. And this is all great and fine and dandy, but I just want you to momentarily kind of put this aside and realize that the reason all this is in place is because what your true role is, is to make sure that the management team doesn't get so bogged down on all this that they forget to protect our customers. So as a director of a bank, you want to make sure that we're staying focused on the true goal, which is protecting our customers. And then again, in 2015 was the next guidance that came out since 2006 that actually addressed what the board of directors should do. Um, there was a five-step program they wanted you to go through, but ultimately what came out of that program that the board is still responsible for is what we call your cybersecurity risk appetite statement. But it was that original statement in the second step of the cybersecurity step assessment tool process that basically said what maturity level do we want to be at, what inherent risk level do we want to be at. And, you know, that's all fine and dandy, right? But again, what you should be asking is, <clears throat> how do these baseline statements in our cybersecurity assessment tool help us protect our customers? If we can keep management focused in on how all these details protect our customer, then you're fulfilling a very important role. And the only people that really can fulfill that role are the directors of a bank. Are we checking them birds? 
is really the main role that you play as a director. And really there's three different areas we're going to talk about a little bit later here that you can focus those questions on. But suffice it to say over the years what we've learned that in order for a bank to stay safe, they need to be ready for an audit at any time. There shouldn't be some kind of a big to-do list to get ready for an audit. We should always be ready for audits. We should have a good awareness training program in place, and we should have the ability to manage new risks as we bring in new assets, as we hire new vendors, or as new threats arise. Which brings me really to the second section here of this movie, which is what can make our birds sick in 2020? I mean, what are the risks that most community-based banks are addressing right now. And so every year at the end of the year, my team and I compile what we call the top seven risk list. And what this is really meant for is to help me guide the boards that I'm speaking to as an auditor when we do our audit debriefings and help them understand how their specific risks relates to the risk that the community at large is addressing. Suffice it to say, these might not be the top seven risks in your bank. These are just the top seven risks that most typical community-based banks are struggling with in 2020, starting with the fact that our customers are really where the weakness is now. Um, the good news is, is we've done a really good job of hardening our posture as a bank. I mean, it's, it's a lot harder to hack into a bank in 2020 than it was in 2019, 2015, 2010, you know, but way back in 2020 when we first started realizing the risk, right? But our customers are soft, a lot of them, our commercial customers especially, but also our, our retail customers. You know, the, we've all heard of the corporate account takeover, we abbreviate as the keto, right? Um, but nowadays, the bad guys are populating databases, identifying who the wealthy people are in America so that they can go after their bill pay accounts. And then, of course, we have a new attack vector, and it's not really that new. It's been around for years and years, but it's starting to materialize one that's being exercised a lot more by malicious actors, and that's called the business email compromise. This is actually a threat vector that you might want to be you know, concerned about in your own business because it's meant to talk business owners into sending money to mules. And what the business email compromise looks like is somebody compromises a business owner's account and then they email to the CFO of the business or the accounting person with the ability to transfer money or wire money and that's how they get money out of the bank's account. They often use this application, it's called Zeus, to get malware on their victim systems. And Zeus is just one of many different malware designer engines that the bad guys are using to target banks, but more importantly, bank customers. And it's not really more importantly, it's just more likely that they're targeting bank customers now. And what we got to realize is that malware is no longer just a virus anymore. They're, the bad guys are leveraging artificial intelligence. They're leveraging big data. You know, they're really developing a good profit engine. I mean, if you think about it, the money that's being made in cybercrime is just astronomical. And, if you th and, and by the way, to answer this question, is it $70 trillion? Back in 2017, Bitcoin was you know, $14,000 a, a coin, and, and thus $5 billion in Bitcoin is actually $70 trillion worth of money was spent unlocking ransomware keys in 2017. And the solution, by the way, is vulnerability management. We're certainly not going to be able to go into it in this movie, but... If you'd like to watch a movie that's specifically geared towards directors about the solution to malware and other problems related to technical attacks, both on banks but also on small businesses, this would be a great movie for you to check out. The third risk that small community-based banks face in 2020 is the longest reigning risk. I mean, this was on our original list that we made in 2007 or 20, you know, 2008. I don't know exactly when we first started the top seven risks list. But suffice it to say, this actually started off as two different bullet points and, and they kind of evolved over time. The user bullet point, there, there's really users, 
you know, can make mistakes and vendors can make mistakes, right? And so we kind of combined them into one risk just because we wanted to make room on our top seven list for newer risks. But this has been on the risk since day one. And it's really the risk that most banks are still struggling with because as we hire new people, we need to get them into the right habits and disciplines to protect the information. I mean, if you think about it, 70% of incidents are still caused by users making mistakes. And it's not just in our bank, it's in our vendors user base. It's in our customers user bank where they could go to the wrong web page, they could click on the wrong link, or they could just give out the wrong information over the telephone, right? So um, our vendors, you know, are still making mistakes. And you got to keep in mind that it's the smaller vendors like Infotex, you know, a local vendor that our customers are not going to forgive us for. And so we have to have a vendor management program in place that will address this risk. The next risk is due to a new guidance that was published on November 14th, 2019. And uh, it really kind of introduced a paradigm shift in the way we think about availability risk. And it's mainly compliance risk, but know that the FFIEC and, and the examiners are saying that supervision will be swift, that, that they're not going to give us a couple years to respond to this guidance before they start asking about it. It's kind of, there's a short punch list of what needs to happen to come into compliance with this guidance. Starting with the fact that we want to update our business impact analysis by establishing maximum tolerable downtimes or, or MTDs for each of our assets. You know, right now we have a, rest, um, a, a what we call a recovery time objective, right? Which says, that, hey, you know, if this asset goes down, we want to be able to bring it back up and running within four hours or 24 hours or whatever. But when will our customers start getting irritated? because we want to make sure our RTO is less than our maximum tolerable downtime. Then meanwhile, dependencies need to be defined for each asset, which is not going to be easy. Uh, one of the things that most information security officers of banks have been complaining about is the fact that they need to draw data flow diagrams. Well, guess what? That can be leveraged to help us determine dependencies uh, when we you know, update our business impact analysis. Testing has been clarified. Uh, there was always a vague guidance on how to test your business continuity plan. And we're going to need to work on our tabletop tests, our resiliency tests, our failover tests to make sure that they come in compliance with guidance. I don't know if you remember, but way back in 2005, 2006, um, the feds, you know, went around and made sure that every bank had a pandemic plan. Um, 14 years later, we still haven't suffered from a pandemic, but it is time to, you know, take them out, dust them off, update them. And we do believe it's something that your examiners are going to be looking for when they come back in to examine your bank. The paradigm shift is important. What they're really doing is they're basically saying that, you know, business continuity is one big umbrella that has underneath it anything related to availability risk, but also emergencies due to technology. And so your bank really has two different documents that will address this guidance. The first being your business continuity plan and your second one being your incident response plan. And they are meant for two different types of emergencies. The business continuity plan is meant for availability emergencies. You know, we lose power or we have a flood, you know, there's an ice storm or whatever. The incident response plan is meant to address incidents related to technology, well, ultimately those that might require that we notify our customers. And hopefully you're realizing that as a director of the bank, the most important priority of both of these incidents is to make sure that we're protecting our customer. I mean, beyond you know protecting life and safety, we wanna make sure that we're protecting our customers. And what we always need to remember is that when we're in an incident, whether it's related to a disaster or whether it's related to technology, you know, a security breach or whatever, the way we act is being watched very closely by a lot of people, including our customers. And so during an incident, we exude what our priorities are. And we're really kind of at a crossroads in the information highway, so to speak, right? 
And what I mean by that is that we could choose to protect our reputation or we could choose to protect our customer's information. And it's kind of ironic that we've got to make that choice because it was the incorrect protection of information that got us in the predicament we're in in the first place, right? But suffice it to say that if we choose to protect reputation over protecting information is what kills our reputation. I mean, do you remember the word Equifax? I mean, let's face it. When they decided that selling stock and then disclosing, when they decided that they were going to make sure that their own people were safe and then give their customers the ability to protect themselves, that's when they destroyed their reputation. So there is a movie on our website that's meant to help you understand your role in incident response. Of all the movies we've talked about today, I would feel like this is probably one of the more important ones for you to watch because it really is you, a director of the bank, who can remind our management team, hey, that's okay, we're gonna protect our customers because doing that will circle back around and protect our reputation. That movie, by the way, talks about how we can turn a lemon into lemonade. The fifth risk that we face because we're a bank that collects information is what we call pretext calling risk. People are calling banks right now and getting our customers to give them information that should not be given unless the caller is properly authenticated. And there's really two impacts of this risk. The first is kind of a normal drip, drip, drip. We've got nosy neighbors. We've got children of, you know, retirees. We've got um, uh, divorcees in, you know, child care, you know, child support litigation that are calling the bank, asking for account balances and getting them even though they're not the person that owns the account. This is happening way too often. And over time, this is really going to lower the confidence that our customers have in us. As importantly, Maybe not as high on the likelihood it's going to happen to our bank, but still very, very scary, very, very dangerous, is the notion that the bad guys now are calling American banks to populate databases so that they can know who has the money, so that they can then attack those people. Remember me talking about the bill pay you know, attack vendor and the first risk that you know, they're going after our customers? Well, how do they know who to go after if they're not a business? They're using pretext calling to find out by calling your bank and asking whoever answers the phone, you know, what the a balance is in an account that maybe they found on the dark web or something. Now they're able to prioritize who they're going to try to attack with, you know, malware or a business email compromise or whatever. The solution to pretext calling risk is by, um, what we call out of wallet questions. It's a means of authenticating um, callers. It's a means of determining is the person that I'm talking to on the phone the person that that person says he or she is? And so we've got to ask questions that can't be answered by finding a lost or stolen purse or by going out of the Facebook, right? And so, you know, mother's maiden name used to be a great out of wallet question, but nowadays it's not because it's too easy to get that information in social media. So you're going to have customers probably talking. Right now, most banks are teaching their employees how to ask out-of-wallet questions. And so it, I would not be surprised if a customer comes up to you someday on the street and says, hey, I, last time I called your bank, I needed to get the payoff on a loan. And they asked me what the collateral was for the loan, or they asked me the amount of the you know, deposit that I, uh, you know, for my paycheck or whatever. You know, and and it's kind of, it seems kind of weird, right? Well, that's because we need to find ways to authenticate telephone callers. There is a movie available if you want to learn more about asking out-of-wallet questions. It is meant for, you know, bank employees. Uh, it's not really meant for directors, but it'll definitely shed light on this um, problem and how the bank is trying to solve the problem if uh, you're interested. The sixth risk that we're adding to our list for the first time this year is probably controversial. I'll bet that most of our clients don't really see this as a risk. And the reason why is because, well, let's back up. IT people find it kind of awkward to talk about this risk in the first place. 
but also we all feel like we can trust the people we work with, right? Or it'd be hard, kind of hard to go to work if we felt like we couldn't trust the people that we work with. We want to trust the people we work with. You as a board want your employees to trust each other. The likelihood is really unknown. We don't really know what the likelihood of this risk is, but the impact is huge. And the reason why is because our customers, they might forgive us if it's Target that cost us to have to change their credit card, you know, and, and send them a new debit card or whatever, right? They might forgive us if it's, you know, our core processor that caused the breach or our internet banking provider that caused the breach. But if it was somebody we hired that maliciously harmed our customers, the impact could be black swan. It could be huge. And so we need to define this threat. And Infotex has come up with our own definition, but what we're encouraging your information security officers to do is to basically define the insider threat in your own terms. But what we need to realize is that, A, it's really hard to detect malicious activity if it's being performed by legitimate users of a network. Now, what Infotex does is we watch bank networks and we can see any kind of illegitimate activity. But if it's activity that's being, you know, perpetrated by somebody with credentials, it's kind of hard for us to say, hey, that's not the right activity without specific controls in place. And those controls include segregation, um, of course, you know, making people take vacations unplugged. Um, cross training, but then also know that your managed security service provider or whoever's controlling your seam can put a watch on assets, they can put a watch on employees, they can put a watch on accounts, um, so that we have a good deterrent in place. You know, often the insider threat arises once employees start thinking that, wow, you know, if somebody did that, no one would know. Well, if we can keep changing the way we know what people are doing, we might be able to have a deterrent in place that solves the insider threat risk. The final risk that we face, hopefully, has already been addressed in your bank, um, but it's the fact that Microsoft is no longer going to support Windows 7 and, and Windows Server 2008. Now, what that means is that they're no longer going to uh, publish patches for all the vulnerabilities that people keep finding in these two applications. And so hopefully your upgrades are already finished. Um, if you had Windows 7 or Windows Server 2008, you should have had them upgraded by January 14th of this year. But if they're not finished, or if you've got some lingering assets that I'll go into in a minute that might not be patched yet, or not, might not be upgraded, I should say, um, then your ISO should be talking to your managed security service provider who can watch for exploits on Windows 7 and Windows Server assets. Um, if you're not upgraded yet, the problem is probably with your vendors or maybe you have some legacy systems out there that just simply can't be updated or maybe there's some dependencies. Maybe if you update you know, your server from you know, Windows 2008 to Windows 16 or whatever, next thing you know you've got a situation where applications are breaking. Um, usually relates to your application publishers and your vendors, but we still need to recognize the risk. And really, by recognizing the risk, we can inform our managed security service provider who can help us mitigate that risk. The longer these systems stay out there, the greater the risk is. So, if you want to learn more about this, we do have a couple articles out there on the internet that might be helpful for you. Uh, to, to get more information about those risks. What questions should we ask? Now, like I said at the beginning, if, if you just ask, how does this protect our customers? That in itself becomes a really good question. So, you know, pretty much anything that your information security officer brings into the board meeting can be followed up with that question. I mean, anything. Let's say your information security officer, you know, brings up that we're behind on awareness training. Well, how does this protect our customers? 
But after a while, let's face it, if every time we ask a question, it's how does this protect our customers, our information security officers are going to think that we only have one question, right? And so um, let's kind of talk about ways that we can ask about these main primary controls here. Audit readiness, if we're not ready for an audit any time, I'm telling you, we're not safe. You know, one of the things we've found by watching all the banks and all the organizations we've worked with since 2020, those that have the bad breaches are the ones that weren't ready for their audits. Those that even though they had a breach, they were able to turn that lemon into lemonade, they're always ready for their audits. And so do you have an organic place, you know, um, uh, an organic process in place to where you have good, solid audit readiness? So the question you could ask about audit readiness then is when the IT auditor comes in to present the audit, you know, how prepared was our team for the audit? You know, did you have to ask for stuff more than once? Um, did they give you all the information you're asking for right off the get-go? Um, were they available for meetings? Uh, did, they, did they look, you know, like they, had, they were on top of everything? When, when they disagreed with you, did they have the confidence to push back? That's audit readiness. When we're ready for audits, we're safe. Meanwhile, there's all kinds of great questions that a director can ask about awareness training. The first and foremost being, does our brand new teller, or maybe fast forward, does our teller after six months, after they understand the climate, after they know what they can and can't get away with, does that teller feel comfortable going to his or her supervisor saying, hey, I think I just clicked on a wrong link, or I think I just made a big mistake that could cause a breach. Self-reporting is one of the most important parts of a bank culture that if it's in place, helps us turn lemons to lemonade. Beyond that, when the ISO comes in, maybe how do we ensure our users are properly trained? Are, are, are we doing homegrown incident response tests? or is a third party facilitating them? That question really relates to what we call management awareness training. The best and easiest way to make sure that your management team is properly trained for their role in cybersecurity is to make sure that they're involved in the incident response tests. What are we doing to educate our customers is a great question you can be asking right now because of all the risk we face when it comes to corporate account takeovers, personal account takeovers, business email compromise, malware, ransomware, et cetera, et cetera. And then finally, you know, what are the new risks and what are we doing about them is a great question. And that can really be asked in almost every situation as well. Um, when the information security officer brings in the vendor report, well, hey, what new vendors are around here? What kind of new risks are we exposed to because of these new vendors? What are we doing about them? would make a great question to ask. If the ISO comes in and says, hey, we're falling behind on this or that, well, what are the risks with falling behind on this or that? And can we at least mitigate those risks? Um, these are the kind of questions that you want to be asking on a regular basis in order to, again, keep our management team out of the details enough to realize that the main goal here is to protect our customers. Um, obviously, this is a movie, so we can't really have a question and answer period now. But if I was you, I would turn to your ISO as soon as he shuts this movie off and say, how does this movie help us protect our customers? And with that, I'd just like to thank you for your time again and, and seriously, your customers. They don't know it, but they really appreciate the fact that you're willing to dedicate this amount of time to the cybersecurity process in your bank. <laughs>
And so, you know, that's a, a pretty good use. What I also would like to, you know, say is that some of our clients are asking us for the original PowerPoint to this. And I think the main reason why is because they want to change the top seven risks. They, they think there's something else that they'd like to put on their board's, you know, radar. And that's great. I, I really like that. Um, when will that movie be ready, Sophia? Um, the movie. It's oh. Oh, yeah, that's right. It's already ready. Yeah, good point. That's the whole point about us doing these as movies, right? And so um, if you go out to movies.infotext.com, not only will you be able to see the webinar that you just watched, uh, but also there will be that movie for your directors that you can send them a link to or play in your next board meeting or, or whatever you think is the best way to handle that. And so um, obviously, like I said with the board, this is a movie. We can't have a question and answer period uh, for this. But if you do have any questions, by all means, you know, send them to you know, info and infotext.com um, and they'll eventually make their way to me and we'll make sure that any questions you might have are answered. Um, and with that, I uh, will turn control of our uh, webinar back to Mr. Mike, which I, for some reason, think is up there somewhere. Great information, as always. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Sophia. And thank you for joining us today.